Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. These are the most extreme runway shows, starting with Chanel Beach, spring, summer 2019, ready to wear. Is this show seriously just called Chanel Beach? Okay, so it took Chanel nine days and a team of 150 people to build an indoor beach inside the Grand Palais, which is where Chanel always shows. It's like this huge flex for them. Like if buildings are status symbols, the Grand Palais is the gold-plated, bulletproof, Rolls-Royce, Eddie Bauer edition. (laughs) The set had actual sand and real wa- real water, obviously, that splashed onto the shore with actual waves. They used 266 tons of sand, which was brought in from a quarry outside of Paris, and enough water to fill a standard size competitive racing pool. Wow, cool, lots of very big numbers. Okay, the actual crazy number about this is the size of the Grand Palais. If you have been to Paris, you might have known that space is a little bit limited there. The Grand Palais is 700,000 square feet. To put that into perspective, an American football field is 60,000 square feet. The Grand Palais can fit 10 of those and still have extra space. It is what the French refer to as a very big building. This video is just going to be us talking about collections like this one, really crazy ones. I've had to divide these into three different categories. Right now we're in a category called insane interiors. Just you wait until we get to the outdoor collections. While we're here, let's knock out some other extreme Chanel shows real quick. The Chanel Iceberg, fall winter 2010, ready to wear. In collaboration with the Ice Hotel in Sweden, Chanel had a 265 ton, 40 meter wide, iceberg transported from... It was transported from a city in Sweden. An iceberg was moved across Europe for this runway show. 40 ice artists sculpted the block in shifts for seven days straight to match Karl Lagerfeld's sketch. The block was made up of a combination of snow and ice or snice? Who wrote this joke? I didn't write that joke. This is the really crazy part. The temperature in the Grand Palais had to stay at negative four degrees Celsius to keep the ice from melting. (laughs) The budget for this was only possible because Chanel was enjoying some of the highest sales in the early 2010s that they've ever seen. Also, inevitably, I have missed some crazy runway show here, so if you can think of something else that's worth checking out, please add it down into the comments. And also, subscribe if you want to learn more about fashion. That's literally all we do here. The Chanel Supermarket. Fall, winter 2014, ready to wear. This is kind of a legendary one for them. If you have seen pictures of some Chanel show, it was probably this one. Campiness level is at 1,000 here. Hey, uh, it actually... It looks like you uh, might have forgotten to subscribe. It's actually, it's right down there. Yeah, just press it with your hand. Thanks. What you may not know about this Chanel show is that the names of the products that were in this fake grocery store are hilarious. I'm just gonna read a bunch of them. We have a, uh, okay, one of them says Cambame, which is supposed to be like a wordplay on Camembert cheese and Rue Cambon, which is the street where Coco Chanel were. These are not funny. They're like funny in like a New Yorker comics kind of way. Okay, I'm not, the the rest of these are not even all that funny. Like Coco Pop cereal, that's like, I guess, sort of. This show was possibly inspired by a photo of Kate Middleton pushing a cart around outside of a grocery store that came out a few years before the show. And it is interesting that Chanel made over 500 different labels so that they could actually fill the grocery store with what appeared to be real product. There are over 100,000 items on display total, which were all given to charity after the show was done. I am so excited about this moving on to McQueen's Voss. Spring, summer 2001. A padded room outfitted with a dirty cube in the middle. At the end of the show, the walls of the cube fell and shattered to reveal this. The woman in the center turned out to be Michelle Ali, a British writer and journalist reclining in the nude, covered in real moths and attached to breathing tubes. I mean, outside of the clothes in this show being some of the best in McQueen's entire career, this was one of the most theatrical and well-executed runway shows maybe of all time. It's what Lee loved to do. This was his thing. Well, that's all the McQueen stuff. Time to move on to another brand that does crazy shows. Psych! Alexander McQueen's Joan. Fall, winter, 1998. A model steps out into a ring of fire inside. Okay, no one ever talks about this. People show images of this show all the time online. Everyone loves The Joan Show. If you know about McQueen, you probably know about this show. No one ever talks about the fact that they were doing fire indoors. 
I'm sure the city of London was incredibly understanding about the idea of pulling permits for pyrotechnics indoors for a one-time event. The city of London has never had trouble with fire. Why would this be a problem? I don't know this. I suspect that they did this without permission. This show was an ode to the historical figure of Joan of Arc who was burned at the stake. Anecdotally, this is also the show where the Lady Gaga look with the red lace comes from. I am strongly tempted to do this entire episode just about McQueen shows, but we're going to keep it to one more, at least uh, in this section. I might do more. I don't know. Alexander McQueen, Spring Summer 99. Number 13. Two robot arms sit in the middle of the runway and models pass by with no indication as to what those arms might do until a model in a white broderie anglaise dress held up by a leather belt walks across and is spun on a platform. Then two industrial machines that are usually used to paint automobiles spray the dress as it rotates. Is this an indoor beach? No, it is not. But it is a mega revered show. And at the time, this like really shook people. Anyway, this now stands as a significant milestone in fashion history. It highlights the crossover between fashion as an art form and contemporary performance art. This was a very big deal. And we cannot talk about incredible interiors and runway shows without talking about Demna's Balenciaga. So let's uh, uh fucking do that. Balenciaga Spring Summer 2020. The room was blue. It was entirely blue. Unsettlingly complete in its blueness. It is the same type of blue that you see in the EU flag. This circular room, very reminiscent of the rooms where grand political bodies meet, was intended to look like the EU parliament. Obviously, if you put them right next to each other, it's not like a one-to-one -one thing, but there's a lot of design language that is carried over from one into the other. This was all done when frustration with EU policies served as a common punchline for the public. And it's just so perfect when you're considering Demna's legacy of discussing power in politics. Another anecdote, we're going to be doing a lot of anecdotes today. The the room was fragranced with smells that are related to power. Using the expertise of scientist Cecil Tolos, they literally pumped the smells of antiseptic, blood, money, and gasoline into the room. The smell was released behind the curtains. That is the craziest thing I have ever heard about. And very literally, the next season was just as crazy. Balenciaga Fall Winter 2020. The first three rows of seats were not used at all, and that is because they were underwater. Models walked on a few centimeters of water under a thousand square foot LED screen ceiling, showing scenes of nature that included crashing waves, churning clouds, swarming crows, and bright red glowing lava, which all ran together and were reflected in the water underneath where the models were walking. This show is nuts. It's not even playing right now. This is only done in post-production and I'm still just so captivated. <laughs> I don't know why I, I, I'm constantly like looking over here as if I can see the stuff I'm showing you. Obviously, this was Demna's discussion of global warming and rising sea levels. And it's good to know that the water was later returned to the water circulation system of the city of Paris. Balenciaga, fall, winter 2022. 360, show in the round. Imagine with me for a moment. You receive your invitation to the next Balenciaga show in the form of a cracked iPhone 6, a relic of tech. You go where the iPhone tells you to go. It's an empty parking lot with a bus waiting for you. You must present said iPhone 6 in order to board the bus. The bus drives you an hour outside of Paris into a large auditorium that you've never seen before because you don't get out much, because you mostly rely on public transportation in the city of Paris and do not have your own car. You then take your seat and the lights come up and behind the glass a raging blizzard is happening indoors. It's literally a snowstorm inside. Models were literally walking in 60 62 mile per hour winds. And actually, interestingly, the models had to be given emergency blankets when they finished walking because it was actually freezing cold in that room. And while the original intention of this show was closer to this idea that weather and very normal experiences that we all get to live through now will eventually become rare enough that we would need to experience them artificially due to climate change, this show also came to quickly represent Demna's escape from his native Georgia through the Caucasus Mountains, which are a snowy landscape that is matched by the runway here and then eventually him getting resettled in Ukraine shortly after. Other shows embracing the 360 theme are Gucci's Fall Winter 2020 rotating show, where the models were dressed, put into hair and makeup, styled, and then presented inside of a rotating backstage area that was visible to the attendees. In terms of access, this show brought you backstage whether you wanted to go or not. This also highlighted the unbelievable amount of hands that it takes to create a runway collection. 
The show was set to Ravel's Bolero, which is a song that is known for being extremely repetitive. The backstage and presentation turned endlessly, highlighting the repetitive nature of creating so many spectacle shows every year. Casablanca just kind of deserves a spot on this list because inside of what was otherwise a fairly standard runway show, there was a pin of live horses. <laughs> Which is actually great because fashion people can get so obsessed with sterility and making sure that everything is just so that they can sometimes kind of take the life out of things. But with this one, they were just kind of letting the horses do their thing and shit everywhere. I really wish that I had gotten to see this show so I could see how like fashion people react to uh, horses shitting. Virgil Abloh said that he wanted to challenge adults to think like children again by using their creativity. The LV Men's 2020 show is a profoundly clear example of that with a surreal cloud landscape full of giant tools used in creative work. A paintbrush, a needle and thread, scissors, and a pencil with a sharpener. There was also a great little reference to the ending of the movie The Truman Show, which before this show was a deeply underappreciated visual moment in film history. Jacques Mousse has dabbled in interior spaces, but in his absolute best interior space, he recreated the Venetian island of Burano, a super colorful and beautiful vacation destination, complete with the hung laundry that you would commonly see in Burano. Mamma mia. Ugh, the lighting changed. This is getting worked on for real. We actually have two studio lights in here right now. It's just that they're not strong enough because you know, the room, she is big. I promise I'm investing in actual light soon. Please bear with me until we, okay, okay all right, all right, here we go. Back to Balenciaga to finish out the interiors. You may know that Balenciaga recently started back up on doing couture collections 53 years after Cristobal Balenciaga stopped. So the building in Paris where Cristobal Balenciaga had his original salon, the ground floor of that is now a Balenciaga store. So the second story of that building was transformed to be an exact replica of Cristobal's original salon. Oh, wait, Cristobal's was on the fourth floor. The one that Demna did was on the second floor, but it was an exact recreation. Details are important. They are literally using the same materials to try to get as close a copy as they can to the original. But Demna said that he wanted the copy to look like what the room would look like now, aged and dusty as if it was just now being opened after being abandoned for 50 years. Y'all, I'm not joking. They recreated the stains from the water damage that was in the original salon. They, they noted where the stains were and they replicated them in their recreation copy. The level of detail for this was insane. Oh my gosh. I am so sick of these lights. How's that? Am I lit now? We're gonna move into a new category now called unconventional locations. It was so easy to fix the lighting problem. This is, this is it right here. We're gonna start with Balenciaga who did a show at the New York Stock Exchange. And now the lighting's back. They sat spectators on the standard stools that are used on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange while screens flickered and glitched over very intense techno music, as per usual for Balenciaga. And they actually did this on a day when the New York Stock Exchange was technically closed, so I, I imagine that booking this, the logistical side of this, would be a nightmare if they were trying to do it while it was open. But yeah, extremely cool idea for a location here. And before Demna had even started at Balenciaga, there was a lot of clear interest on his part in doing unusual locations. The budget at Balenciaga has certainly enabled him to start building things. Like he's able to take on projects where they have to assemble large things and like do these you know feats that are against the natural order. But while at Vetma, he presented his collections in very unconventional locations, including the French National Museum of Natural History, where he presented fall winter 2019 in front of many taxidermied animals. And you can watch the analysis for that show here. This is one of the most fun videos that I have ever recorded. You should, you should definitely watch that one. It's clickable, I think on this side. Probably my favorite location for Demna of all time though is in spring summer 20 where he showed on the Champs-Elysees McDonald's. It's a simple idea that only Demna could pull off. And maybe Doublet. Doublet probably could have done a show at a McDonald's. All right, so all the other runway shows on this list are gonna seem very small in comparison to the one we're about to talk about. And strangely, no one really ever talks about this thing. The Yves Saint Laurent Colors of the World show. This was a 15 minute runway show hosted in the opening ceremony of the final France World Cup match in 1998. 300 of Yves' most iconic looks were on open display at the Stade de France. Yeah, 300 looks. For crazier numbers, let's consider the 900 backstage hands, 100 and 30 dressers, 4,000 stadium staff, 80,000 spectators in the stadium, and 1.7 billion worldwide viewers. 
This show presented every major offering that Yves Saint Laurent had ever done throughout his entire career up to that point. I mean, if we're kind of liberal with the term runway show, this is the largest scale runway show of all time, I'm pretty sure. You'll notice how I don't commit to anything. I hedge all of my sentences. And that's how come I'm never wrong. <laughs> Which isn't even true. I hedge all the time and I'm still wrong constantly. In another incredible feat, the Great Wall of China hosted its first runway show ever for Fendi's Spring Summer 2008 show. Okay, so this show took place an hour north of Beijing and they had initially planned it for their the first date. They were like, we're gonna do it for fall winter 2007. And then uh, the, the time was coming very close and they couldn't get anyone in the Chinese government to talk to them so they pushed it back to spring summer 2008 and then they just barely got it under the wire because the permits were approved six weeks before the actual show was stated to start slated to start this show this show almost didn't happen that's the point the show almost didn't happen when bernard arnaud ceo of the conglomerate lvmh who owns fendi was asked about the show he said that it was quote the first fashion show visible from the moon which is a myth this is unrelated and bernard arnaud clearly was being he, he was joking but the the great wall of china is certainly 100% not visible from the moon. It is sometimes visible from low orbit space if like it's a not a cloudy day and you know exactly what you're looking for because it's actually kind of hard to see because the surrounding soil is the same color as the Great Wall itself. But you, you absolutely cannot see the Great Wall of China from the moon. Dior showed their Cruise 2016 show at the Pierre Cardin house, which was a huge inspiration for Raph Simmons, who was the designer at Dior at the time. Pierre Cardin, one of the great grandfathers of fashion, created this bubble house in the the south of France to live in personally. And it feels kind of weird that like a fashion show would be held at a house of a former designer that technically doesn't have anything directly to do with that fashion house itself, right? There's not really much else to say about this. I kind of just wanted to show everyone the Pierre Cardin house in case you hadn't seen it before. It's completely crazy, right? When I showed this to my dad who clearly knows a thing or two about interior design, he just like shook his head quietly and I was like, what? And he was like, curved walls. Why would anyone want to live in curved walls? My, my father is very serious about aesthetics. Another extreme runway location is the Gucci Cruise 2017 show at Westminster Abbey. A lot of people consider this to be sacrilegious because, you know, it's a little scandalous. Also shocking that they allowed an Italian brand to show in a UK monument. You'd think that other brands like McQueen or Burberry would have gotten to it first, but apparently not. Moving on, Yves Saint Laurent always does their shows in front of the Eiffel Tower at the Trocadero in Paris, but would you believe that Chanel did a full recreation of the Eiffel Tower inside of the Grand Palais for fall winter 2017? Chanel as a brand has done some uh, some pretty wild stuff. In other crazy Chanel show news, they showed in Cuba for the Resort 2017 show. The crazy thing was that two hours after American Fashion Press landed to cover the show in Havana, the first US cruise ship docked in Cuba for the first time in 40 years. Not the Chanel show specifically, but all of the things happening around Cuba at the time, that was, that was a very big political moment in recent history. Okay, 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 final category, outdoor installations. I'm so excited, this is the really nut stuff. Okay, so if you have been on fashion internet recently, you saw the new Louis Vuitton men's show. Okay, you probably did not see pictures of the full runway show like backed up and empty. This is what it looked like. It's a Hot Wheels track. Okay, so the scale here is what I want everyone to understand because it's easy to look at this and be like, oh fun, a Hot Wheels track, that's neat. This whole thing, the whole, let's make it big. Full screen please. This whole thing was built used for a day and then disassembled. This is an unbelievably massive undertaking. This is like the only one where I'm like not showing any runway footage because it's just kind of like, look at this. Another huge outdoor installation was the recent Yves Saint Laurent men's show. This is the spring summer 2023 show in a desert outside of Marrakesh. <clears throat> I am actually gonna lose my voice. I'm gonna go get some tea. Okay, hopefully this helps. There was this lit up, I, I, don't, I don't know what this is, a, a ring thing that the models walked around as the sun went down. Super intense. Marrakesh was a huge deal for the brand because it was where the founder, Yves Saint Laurent, would travel in order to escape from his work. And you can't talk about installations without talking about Rick Owens' spring summer 2019 show, Babel. In which case you may have guessed a structure that resembled the fabled Tower of Babel is slowly set ablaze in the center of the Palais de Tokyo. 
I have very strong feelings about this show because it is actually the second runway show that I ever made an analysis video on. And recently Rick did a fairly similar idea in spring summer 23 for his show titled Ed Fu, where he got these giant metal balls that were lit on fire and then had a giant crane pick them up and then drop them into a pool of water in the center of the Palo de Tokyo courtyard. This is, a, this is another show where it's just kind of like, wow, how did you get permits to do this? Balma's fall 2021 show took place on the actual wing of an Air France plane. Much of that show's theme centered around the return to the glamorous age of flying, which means no sweatpants. Okay, so now that we've talked about all these other ones, let's let's talk about the the, the master of outdoor shows, Jacques Mousse. We have Spring 2020, which you have for sure seen, possibly in my video where I cover all of the Jacques Mousse shows up to that point. Very proud of this episode. It was executed in a lavender field in Jacques Mousse's beloved south of France. We then have Spring 2021, in the wheat field show. Then we have Spring 2022, where we get the Hawaii show, where the runway was at the base of a Hawaiian mountain. But okay, the craziest part of this show is that it rained briefly before it began, and the Jacques Mousse team was frantically having to drive the clothes and the runway, but then out of nowhere, they got to host a runway show underneath a full and complete rainbow. What Jacques Mousse does best is that they convince you that it's so easy to have a runway show with this kind of impact. You just find a place with lots of natural beauty and that's all that you ever need. But what isn't talked about is that a beautiful, particularly grand location can always overpower a collection. And that it's just super easy to throw down a runway in the middle of anywhere beautiful. Jacques Mousse shows us now for the fourth time in fall 2022 that this is truly a balanced, difficult, and incredibly well-considered decision. Decision. You can see that most clearly with the salt mountain that was an excavated switchback path with two beautifully constructed entrances on their runway, a rotating platform in the middle, and a lot of guest seating that surprisingly looked like it was just naturally part of the landscape, all of which was made of salt. There's just an enormous amount of, of grooming and preparation work that has to go into making things look this convincingly, beautifully natural. It really is a pretty insane feat what they do. Some more incredible show ideas include Kid Super's Super Bees show, a real life art auction and runway show. And you can also watch my video here about this show. It was, it was crazy. They had an actual art auctioneer and gave people real paddles that they bid real money with. It was so crazy. Iris Van Herpen's Fall 2021 collection concluded with one of her absolutely bonkers dresses jumping out of an airplane. And before anybody says anything, I understand that Kid Super also did a skydiving runway show, but there is a, like a difference in context here. Iris Van Herpen's stuff is so firstly delicate, and just the context is so different. Iris's other shows are these just marvels of like, you feel like you're surely not watching stuff that happened in real life. It feels very magical and, and kind of like CG powered almost. But the, the thought of one of these dresses then getting put onto an airplane, like strap up the helmet, instructor person is like, are you ready? And then the model jumped out of the airplane wearing the dress. I don't know. This is, this is nuts. I love it so much. I love Iris Van Herpen. Iris. It's Iris Van Herpen, my bad. Moving on to Balenciaga Spring 2022 show, affectionately called Clones. Again, you can watch my video about it here. I'm actually, this is probably the, if I had to pick a single video that I'm the most proud of, it is this one, you should watch it. Okay, so this one is a little bit contested because it, it wasn't a real show in that no one went to it, but also it was real in that some actors and extras were paid to sit in the audience during the filming of the presentation. The way that I talked about it in my analysis for this show is that the realest, like the, the realest version of this show is the version that you watch on your phone at home. And that as far as like things happening in real life that this show did not happen in real life because one of the house models, Eliza Douglas, her face was deep faked onto other models that also walked, but also not all of them because some of them were Eliza Douglas. Basically, there's a lot of things about this that have been so digitally manipulated that we are completely uncertain what parts of this were a real runway show. I'm not even sure if this is a runway show at all, but if it is, it's insane. On the Navigli Canals of Milan, Carol outfitted his models with flotation devices under their backs, underneath a collection that was filled with subversive nuance that I covered in enormous detail in this video. There really isn't too much like 
crazy detail stuff to talk about in the context of this video here, but I mean, this this show is wild looking and this this survives on mood boards here, here. I mean, somewhere in the world right now, someone is putting this into a mood board. It's a classic and it's one of the blueprints that has kind of defined modern subversive runway shows. This is, this is an incredible one. The best part is that no one who was in attendance for this show knew when it was starting. None of them knew what they were expecting. They didn't know to look down at the water. It's just that they were told to gather on one of the bridges over the canal. And then at some point someone was like, holy shit, is that guy dead? And then I, I guess the show started. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. Join that Patreon. This is literally my only source of income. This is my full-time job. I am here learning about fashion and then showing everyone what I learned. That is, uh, that's literally, it's, um, it's my job. I have the greatest job on earth. It's pretty sick. I like it a lot. But I also live at my parents' house, so uh, please support the Patreon <laughs> so that I can uh, live a regular adult life. I will talk to everyone next week. Text your mom and tell your lover with no context.